I'm thankful to be before you guys again, uh, filling in for pastor uh, while he's away for training. Uh, we greatly feel his absence, and no doubt he misses being assembled here together with us. Know that it gives him great joy to see operations continue to, to move slowly uh, in this assembly while he's away. I would challenge you all to make a diligent effort to, to pray for him while he's away, and also to, to pray for him while he's here, too. While I was preparing for topics to present, I remembered sil- several years ago when Brother Jim was challenging young preachers uh, one fall evening to come up with an evangelistic me- message on uh, one of several events in the Apostle Paul's life, as recorded in the book of Acts. To my knowledge, no young preacher has ever taken him up on his challenge, um, though lately in the last several years when I've been getting up for work, I've noticed that if I haven't slept on my pillow with the perfect form and precision, when I wake up, I can't turn my head to the left. So I don't think the classifier young pertains to me anymore, but <laughs> I would like to present a uh, um, take up his challenge and present on the conversion of uh, a Roman soldier in uh, Philippi. I am thankful that unlike Jude, I got to write and now speak about our common salvation. For tonight's study, we will focus on the Roman soldier whose acceptance of Christ had a profound impact on the first Christian foothold in Europe. Our main study this evening will be Jack's, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 16, verse 23 through 34. Let's go there now to kick off our study. All right. Starting in verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep him safely who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the others, uh, suppo- supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them out of his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. What a wonderful account to consider tonight. In order to properly set the scene and context of these verses, we need to adjust the focus of our lens and zoom out slightly. What we observe is prior to the events is that Paul was in the beginning stages of his second missionary journey he, that he started with Silas in Acts chapter 15, 40 through 41. The preceding verses of our study text in chapter 16 begin to reveal the circumstances that led Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul and Silas praying and singing hymns in a dark Roman prison. Paul assembled a crack team of missionary partners to minister along with and to disciple. Paul chose Timothy and Lystra and Luke while in Troas. After assembling this mission's dream team, Paul was forbidden by the Holy Spirit from ministering in Asia Minor. Unbothered by the direction 
the Holy Spirit led in, Paul was soon granted a glimpse of the Lord's desire of a, with a vision of the gospel light being carried to the people of Europe starting in Macedonia. After receiving explicit guidance from the Lord, Paul and his team of ministers wasted no time in being obedient to the Lord's will and set off to where God would have the gospel establish a beachhead on the European continent. The missionary team landed at the port city of Neapolis in Macedonia and set off by foot to the city of Philippi, eight miles away. Chapter 16 and in verse 12, it's stated that Philippi was a chief city in that region of northern Greece and a Roman colony. Now, I absolutely love history and geography, so the book of Acts is right up my alley. I would never forgive myself if we didn't dig here a minute to establish good historical understanding of the location of this stellar conversion account. Philippi was named after Philip of Macedon, or Alexander the Great's father. It was set in an incredibly strategic location with, and was heavily fortified. <clears throat> the city later, in fact, played a critical role in Roman history, being the location where Augustus Caesar won a decisive victory and conquered his enemies to secure his role as the first Roman emperor. In honor of this momentous occasion, the emperor ordered the city of Philippi to be given the important status of a Roman colony. Being labeled as a colony gave Philippi a great deal of economic advantages in the Roman-controlled world, with the city being modeled like a miniature Rome itself. A characteristic and a measured detail of relevance to our study passage is that Roman colonies, after a 20-year career in the Roman army, a soldier was provided property in a Roman colony for retirement. Such a possibly retired, old, battle-hardened Roman veteran we meet in the man that was given charge to incarcerate Paul and Silas after the evangelistic successes of, as souls were won to the Lord in the city of Philippi. In direct contrast to this crusty model of a Roman citizen, Paul, prior to causing civil unrest, shared Christ with a woman named Lydia, who was of a gentle, meek disposition, and she and her family loved God. When she heard of the Lord's provision of a Savior in his own son and the forgiveness of sin that he did proffer in the shedding of his own blood on the cross of Calvary, she and her family were fully receptive to the truth of God's very word. They wasted no time in following the Lord in faith and obedience and baptism. This formed the start and the core of the church at Philippi. After this glorious success recorded for us in verse 14 and 15 of our study chapter, Paul and his team continued to canvas the city for receptivity of the gospel message. As they ministered in the city, it is stated that a young girl possessed by a demon, who certain men profited from by her soothsaying, grieved Paul with her banter for several days. Paul, being an apostle, was able to cast the evil spirit from her and in the pattern of such miracles recorded in the New Testament, faith and belief followed. Paul and Silas find themselves recipients of a vicious, undeserved, and severe beating as a result of those who profited from the slave girl's possession, stirring up Roman nationalism in the streets of Philippi. As a result of the unrest, local Roman officials called magistrates made a hasty, uncalculated order to beat the two Roman citizens without a fair trial, contrary to Roman law, assuming they were foreigners and non-freemen. After the Roman lictors savagely beat the men of God with hardened birch rods in execution of the magistrate's orders, they were put in the supervision of the subject of our study. The Philippian jailer who being no stranger to war, brutality, and was particularly callous to the dregs and depths of human depravity in the Roman world, took charge, violently took charge, of the badly wounded missionaries and threw them in the most secure portion of the prison in Philippi and locked their feet in a wooden beam as we see in verses 23 and 24 of the text. 
just think, just think to yourself now, how would I handle myself if I were in Paul and Silas's p- position? Would you be emotional, filled with anger and hate for those who wronged you? Be honest. Where would your mind be, lying in a dark, dank, cold prison, locked in a wooden beam after being falsely accused and beaten within an inch of your life? Over ten years later, Paul writes to this church in Philippi, who he dearly loved and planted. In the book of Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29 and 30. It's Philippians chapter 1, verses 29 and 30. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now hear it to be in me. The apostle to the Gentiles was no stranger to persecution for the cause of Christ. In these verses, he is recalling to this church at Philippi what they had witnessed and heard of Paul as he labored for the cause of Christ. Inside that prison, late into the night, Paul and Silas were not consumed with rage or wrath. Verse 25 records for us. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. Rather than taking hold and manifesting the fruits of the flesh, the response of these two servants of the Lord are mature and in accordance with the will of God. While under immense physical pain and discomfort, they sought the Lord's face in prayer and sung hymns of praise and thanks to the Lord in the form of psalms. These actions we see in the end of verse 25 were done not in secret, but were clearly heard and understood by all that were in the prison. From the evidence that we see in the scripture, these prayers and the hymns that they sang were not lacking in God's word and substance, as a tremendous testimony for the Lord was displayed in their actions and that had a profound impact on that city. No doubt, the truth of God's word and the singing of great spiritual truth echoing through the walls of the prison was a new occurrence in that prison and drastically different from the normal dark noises the jailer, his Roman guards, and the fellow prisoners usually heard. The Lord desired that those men in that prison and all men throughout all ages receive the truth of the gospel message. The scriptures reveal to us that after midnight, God caused a miraculous event and a great earthquake that shook the prison from top to bottom in verse 26. This part of Macedonia is no stranger to earthquakes, but this earthquake was recognized as supernatural in origin with all the doors of the prison being allowed to fling open and the prisoners restraints as they fell off. Perhaps one of the very psalms Paul and Silas sang was Psalm 107. Verses 13 through 16 state, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of the darkness and the shadow of death, and brake their bands in sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron asunder. This miraculous event, no doubt, was incredibly reassuring to the missionary team. They clearly understood that they were exactly where the Lord would have them to be. That in the darkness, cold, and through the pain and agony, the Lord was there listening as his word declares he would. More importantly, Paul and Silas must have known they still had work to do for the Lord. Their preaching, prayers, and psalms had planted a seed of truth in one of the most unlikely of places as perceived by the human mind. 
the heart of an old soldier and prison warden. We see the state of mind of the prison keeper in verse 27. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep, and seeing that the prison doors were open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had fled. After jostling awake, rather unexpectedly and violently, with the earthquake, the jailer thought that surely his own life was in peril, as the doors were open and all his wards had escaped. To understand this, in Roman military honors, in the Roman military honor system, it was expected, um, it was accepted and expected for officers who had failed at their post to impale themselves on their sword. This was a way to avoid their families from shame and to ensure that their property was transferred to their families. In contrast, if a failed officer or one who was in charge of prisoners failed and themselves were apprehended, they would be publicly shamed, beaten openly, beheaded, and their property would be taken by the state. To the veteran Roman officer that had been appointed to the prison, uh, to the position of keeper of the prison, he only saw one way out in order to save his family of shame and the loss of their possessions by his perceived failure. The Philippian jailer in that very instant came to the end of himself. But thankfully, before he hastily carried out his own death, the apostle called to him after clearly seeing the panicked Roman in verse 28. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we are all here. Here, after being stopped by Paul's Caring words from taking his very life after coming to the bitter end of himself, the need of the jailer's soul came into question. As the text continues, no doubt still reeling from the event and newfound spiritual realization, the jailer called for his soldiers. Then he called for a light, sprang in, came trembling, and fell before Paul and Silas. Here, we start being able to identify evidence of this man is starting to have a change of mind of his personal sin before God and his need of a savior. He had never heard anything like the prayers and the Psalms that Paul and Silas spoke ever before. He had never heard of our Lord before and could identify these servants had a genuine and abiding relationship with the one true God. That was in total contrast to his culture's pagan construct of religion. He could easily see that these men had a testimony like none other he was used to dealing with in his time in the prison or his entire life. To the natural man praying and singing of thankfulness to God after such harsh treatment is incomputable. It simply doesn't add up. My mind goes straight to Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Among whom also we all had our conversion, our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. While his fleshly heart was awakened to his spiritual need, the Roman officer assembled his men with a lantern, as he had done time and time again, and proceeded to the gathering of prisoners that had assembled, no doubt around Paul and Silas, waiting to hear what they had to say about the events that had just taken place. When he got to the missionaries, completely against his status as a Roman officer and the appointment he carried as the warden of the prison, he fell down to his knees before Paul and Silas, physically trembling. And for the first time in his existence, he understood his sin's consequence before sovereign God. Our culture can easily miss the significance of the position the Roman took before these servants of the Lord. In the ancient world, your class and position was everything. 
when kneeling, bowing, or falling before, and any other similar physical positions are used, it is most always a sign of respect, reverence, and clearly identifying that the recipient was in a position of authority over oneself. At this point, the jailer was still under the impression that Paul and Silas were non-Roman citizens, and by implication, barbarians to his culture. Regardless, after hearing the words of life that the missionaries offered, the battle-scarred soldier had a paradigm shift and found himself kneeling before the Lord's humble servants. We can easily identify this in this verse and in the following verse. And brought him out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? <clears throat> in the United States Air Force, we have a cult cultural nuance within the Department of Defense in that we use the pronoun sir and ma'am when addressing individuals of all ranks. Whereas many other branches, um, the term of address is only used for NCO or more commonly officer tiers. When the jailer of Philippi addressed Paul and Silas, this was not in the same manner I just spoke of. The Greek word kurios is used to recognize authority and is a title of honor expressive of respect and reverence with which servants greet their masters. Often it is the word that is used in the context of addressing God the Father and the Messiah as Lord as well. On his knees, this man was humbled before God and had a different outlook on his sin. For the first time, he saw his sin as the Lord in heaven saw it, desperately wicked. We often call this repentance from the Holy Scriptures, meaning a change of mind. And it's just what I stated when this man recognized his sin for what it was. He knew he was lost and without hope. Note, this was something he didn't just figure out of himself. It wasn't just revealed to him because he was opening his mind to the world's wisdom. He heard the holy word of God as presented by God's very vessels that were Paul and Silas. Also, this repentance was no work the soldier did. No, absolutely not. All he did was accept God's word for what it already said about him and what he was. <clears throat> he had to know he was lost before he was saved. Which, praise God, he did. And thankfully, he responded appropriately. Seeking clarity from the word of the Lord via these missionaries in what must I do to be saved? Again, the answer is not any work of man, but a, a work of God. Just think about that question. What an amazing question to ask. I personally can't think of a better question for somebody that is lost and without the Lord of Heaven to ask. True North Baptist Church, we ought to be praying that somebody would ask us such a question. We also ought to be ready to take them to the scriptures and bring them the understanding for, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. <clears throat> so then, we know Paul's answer to this man was in harmony with the rest of the scriptures. His answer is in verse 31 and 32. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. We see here that Paul wasted no time and took them straight to the water of life the Lord Jesus directly. The apostle explained from God's very word that Jesus was the son of God and that he was the spotless lamb that was slain for the payment of man's sin. And though he was slain, God raised him from the dead. Paul could easily see the fruits of repentance that John the Baptist preached and knew what he needed next from God's very own word. We clearly see that just the keeper of the prison was not the sole audience for Paul and Silas's exposition of the scriptures, but the Roman soldier's whole household. 
Their response to Paul's preaching was seen in verse 33 and 34. And he took them the same hour of night and washed their stripes and was baptized. And uh, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So then what was the response? Belief and faith. Praise God. Accompanying that was a total change in behavior as well. We see that instead of the crusty, hardened old soldier who treated the missionaries harshly, the jailer and his family um, take them into their home immediately after making their choice to put their faith in the one true God and the payment that was offered at the cross for their sins. Then they tenderly care and dress their wounds and feed them at that late hour. The scriptures tell us how they did it. They rejoiced the whole time. I don't know about you, but I don't particularly love getting woke up in the middle of the night. I believe I got my fair share of that when I worked for the city. This family rejoiced the whole time because they had a new name written down in glory. <clears throat> um, two key false assumptions or even false doctrines I would like to dissolve after going through this is the concept of infant baptism and easy believism. Many misguided individuals or some false Teachers would point you to this passage as a defense for their false positions. While disregarding the scriptures, what the scriptures are telling us, or what the rest of scripture has to say on the subject. The proponents of the camp that advocate for the position of infant baptism, when asked to bring scriptural evidence to their position, will most likely point to Acts chapter 16 and state, it says, their whole house, referring to the houses of Lydia and the houses of the Philippian jailer. They state that based on the assumption that the houses must have babies or very young children in them. Nowhere in scripture is it stated the composition of those two houses. Also, the scripture is very clear on the need for an individual to cognitively comprehend the gospel, understand their need of it, and put their faith and trust into it. An infant does not have the ability to do that. I'm in no way saying that God does not provide for these little ones. We clearly see this in the life of David when he refers to his and Bathsheba's deceased child. The promoter of the easy believism camp would point you to verse 31 and state that it just says, believe on, then would say that repentance is just a work and that it's not required for salvation to occur. This is not what we see here at all. Jesus himself stated in Mark 1, 15 and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Also, whereas the word repentance, or repent, were not used in the study scripture, we can clearly see the meaning of the word demonstrated in the jailer's actions, as we discussed. Paul saw the man's repentance clear as day, as his actions were in direct contrast to the cultural norm of a Roman Gentile. Notice that unlike those who practice easy believism, the apostle and his team of missionaries did not simply lead the keeper of the jail and his family in a prayer and then offer him assurance that he was now saved. Paul and Silas told him to believe on the Lord Jesus, and then shortly thereafter he stated, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord. Will you go back and notice the response of the veteran soldier and his family? After salvation, what was the first thing on their mind? The scriptures say that, and he took them the same hour by night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. Look at the response time of this guy. He did not waste any time, much like Lydia and her family. After the word was proclaimed to him, he immediately rendered medical care and joined one of the Lord's churches through baptism. In fact, the very one that started right before Paul and Silas were th thrown into jail. The urgency of the matter of aligning with a local scriptural body of believers bookends the verse with the same hour of night and straightway. <clears throat> now, drawing this lesson down to a close, 
Where do you find yourself this evening? Are you in the same position that this old soldier found himself in? Hearing God's word, but not knowing how to respond to the truth that is being revealed? If you are, know that the will of God is that you would be expeditious in getting this matter taken care of. Be like the Roman and hastily find a trusted man or woman of God who can explain the scriptures and ask, what must I do to be saved? Are you saved and have not been obedient in joining yourself to a scriptural body of believers? Won't you take care of that matter just like this family did and straightway be baptized and join a local church? Are you a member of this church and are holding back from being involved in the ministry of this church? Ask yourself, what's preventing you from following the Lord in total and utter obedience and yieldedness? I would tend to think that the Philippian jailer was incredibly grateful that there were men that were submitted to the Lord and were his vessels to carry the gospel to the ears of an aging soldier. I would assume that he would respond with a resounding amen to Romans chapter 10 in verses 14 and 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Let's pray. Most heavenly, gracious Father, we come before you and we approach your throne and we thank you for who you are, what you are. We thank you for the, the gift of salvation that your son proffered us on the cross, shedding his very blood for us, Lord. We know that it was nothing we did of ourselves, just understanding our need expressed by your word and putting our faith and trust in what was done for us, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for this body, Lord, that you have set us in. Pray that we be yielded vessels for your purposes. We pray that we be like this jailer we studied tonight, that we would be serious about your church and responsive to your word, Lord, and your guidance of it. Please uh, pray that you'd bless our evening. Pray that every word would be glorifying to you and edifying to one another. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.